Thank you for attending Cannabis Regulatory Deep Dive Interstate Commerce, hosted by the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center at The Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. Before we begin, we have a few notes we would like to share with you. First, to streamline the appearance of the webinar, we suggest that you hide non-video participants. To do that, click on the three dots at the top right corner of any participant box that has their video off and click hide non-video participants. Second, we wanna draw your attention to the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. You may submit questions at any time. Please note, however, that there is only a limited time available for Q&A. Third, closed captioning has been enabled for this event. To change how you view the transcription or to hide it, click Live Transcript in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window. Finally, this event is being recorded. The recording will be made available on the event page and social media channels as soon as possible after the event. Follow us at OSU Law DEPC to stay up to date on our research, programming, and future events. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the event. Doug? Thank you so much, Jana, and thanks to everybody joining us today uh, for this cannabis regulatory deep dive. I am Doug Berman, I'm the Drug Enforcement and Policy. Center's faculty director. Uh, I want to say a few things about the work the center does and encourage uh, those attending uh, not only to join me in thanking our participants, but also in letting us know what other work we could do that could help the work that you're doing uh, in this interesting area. Uh, DEPC is a law school-based center at the Ohio State University Morris College of Law, where we conduct research, scholarship, education programs, programming like this, uh, in order to encourage uh, public understanding, public engagement, uh, on the myriad issues that surround drug enforcement, you might say the drug war more generally, as well as efforts to move away from the criminal justice model. And that has led us to make cannabis reform and regulation uh, a centerpiece of the work we're doing because of the rapid evolution of the laws and the uncertain impact that we're seeing uh, when we're seeing at the state level, particularly cannabis reform. Uh, against that backdrop, we've had the great opportunity to do a number of panels, particularly in the last year or so, together with Shalene Title, who's been a distinguished practitioner in residence uh, with us, looking really deeply at some of the more complicated issues. Um, if you're like me and follow this area fairly closely, you see a lot of kind of, I don't want to call it superficial, but at least cursory analyses. Uh, and it's, we think, so valuable to, to take the kind of deep dive uh, we're imagining with this event and that we imagine to be part of a series of events. We have another panel uh, in the works for later this summer. There may be some papers that are gonna be emerging from uh, this deep dive we're taking on a range of cannabis regulatory issues. And against that backdrop, I'm just extraordinarily grateful that uh, the fellow I'm gonna introduce now, Jeremy Burke, uh, who is a senior reporter for the Business Insider, uh, agreed to serve as the moderator for this terrific panel of experts uh, looking at the interstate commerce issues, all the intricate complicated questions that are necessarily arising as we think we're moving closer and closer to some kind of uh, federal cannabis reform against the backdrop of state experiences now going on close to a quarter century if we, we look all the way back to medical reform starting in California. And so uh, without further ado, and thanks again to those attending and those participating and an encouragement that you reach out to the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center with follow-up on this issue and others in this space, I'll now kick it to Jeremy Burke and, and look forward to hearing him uh, sort of her, heard the crew into a really deep discussion of of the kinds of issues that that the that that get very deep pretty quickly. So with that, thank you, Jeremy, and and thanks to you all for attending. Yeah, Douglas, I appreciate the introduction. So as Douglas mentioned, I'm a senior reporter at Business Insider, uh, where I cover the cannabis industry. And it's always a fascinating job. Um, I guess I should talk a little bit about. Uh, my experience covering the space. Uh, I started around 2016. Um, at that time, there were very few sort of mainstream financial publications like Business Insider covering the industry. It was sort of like, you know, the coverage you saw out there was maybe news about a dispensary opening or something like uh, the 10 best weed strains on high times. We, we decided to take a forward-looking perspective and really look at the industry as a new multi-billion dollar category, right? There's all these sort of nitty gritty issues, which we'll discuss shortly about, uh, you know, how the industry will be regulated. Who, who is legalization supposed to affect? What are the stated goals of the program? 
how are companies navigating the often Byzantine and quickly changing regulations of the industry? So we'll get into all of that, but quickly for those of you who maybe are less familiar or, or have a bit more of a cursory understanding of the subject, I wanted to kind of set the framework before we hear, excuse me, from our uh, super smart and wonderful speakers. So, um, you know, there, there has been a lot of ink spilled, as I'm sure you're aware if you follow this issue about marijuana legalization. Um, Oftentimes in my head, it falls into two buckets and, and we try and zig where others zag, but uh, there, there's the element of reefer madness, which is persistent and it's a sort of persistent uh, symptom of the war on drugs that still remains. Uh, and there's also sort of the nuts and bolts like stock coverage, like where to invest, what stocks are going up and, and oftentimes right now what stocks are going down. Right in the middle, I think, is where the interesting area is because at this point, the cat's out of the bag. We have, you know, 18 states have legalized marijuana. That includes, you know, the country's largest urban centers, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, all have legal marijuana. Uh, 38 states have legalized medical cannabis. That's over two thirds of the US population. Polling shows that over 90% of American voters support at least uh, medical legalization, if not recreational legalization as well. The science around cannabis is rapidly developing. It's used to treat chronic conditions, ranging from glaucoma to insomnia and even childhood epilepsy. There are companies with multi-billion dollar market caps that are frozen out of the U.S. financial system. There are severe difficulties for small business owners, entrepreneurs, and those on the social equity side from actually opening businesses, including uh, you know, getting loans at favorable rates, creating sustainable long-term revenue driving businesses, acquiring licenses, dealing with all the legal issues and complying with regulations. Um, what that's given rise to right now with this sort of state federal conflict is there are some well-capitalized firms that have taken advantage of the system, right? Um, for better or worse, they've created monopolies. They've sort of use their story to show retail investors, uh, you know, mom or pop investors, how they will dominate the industry. And they've really sort of been aggressive about pushing out competition within states that they operate in. Um, but it's not easy to be those companies either, not to sort of um, castigate them, right? They, you know, if you're operating in Illinois, you have a whole different set of regulations than you would if you were operating in California. Where a lot of this conflict comes from is because, like I said, of the conflict between state and federal law. Every state municipality has their own regulations guiding cannabis, as we'll hear about, and the federal government has mostly so far taken a hands-off approach. That doesn't mean that they've been proactive at all about sort of thinking about the long-term focus of this industry. There has been some changes with past attorney generals, but most of the time they said states can do what they're going to do. We're not going to interfere, but we're not going to actually help anything as well. There are some, that being said, Congress people who are focused on changing this. There's a lot of legislation that's currently being bandied about, often unsuccessfully in Congress right now, that would fix things like banking issues, uh, access to the industry for entrepreneurs and those harmed by the, by the war on drugs, um, as well as sort of broader criminal justice reform bills that place cannabis front and center. With that being said, I think, as I've hopefully laid out here, Creating a legal, sensible cannabis industry from the ground up is really difficult work and demands full-time focus from very smart people. Today, we're going to hear four different perspectives uh, about how to move forward and how to sort of rectify this state and federal conflict around transferring cannabis between state lines and how the interstate commerce of the cannabis industry is really going to develop over the next few years. All of our panelists do agree that federal legalization is perhaps an inevitable consequence of all the activity going on today. And they all also agree that the current patchwork of state legalization isn't really tenable. But most do disagree on the nuances and the mechanisms that should be tweaked in order to ensure that the industry is built in a fair way that's competitive for everyone involved. So with that, I will kick it to Shaleen, who also organized the event, and uh, give it to her to take it away about um, uh, you know, her perspective. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, so I'm going to set my timer for 10 minutes so I don't go over. So um, the federal legalization conversation is weird. Uh, I think it is not really grounded in reality. 
And so for me, the goal of this session is to share some basic concepts uh, with the hope that you all will go out and elevate the dialogue around federal legalization and potentially come up with your own, um, your own paths forward. But today we have a really great set of speakers. I wanna thank everybody um, who's participating. We have a group of people who have all um, published and spoken with deep expertise on interstate commerce, um, but with different ideas for moving forward. And we're all operating within the same shared understanding that is useful to, to share with you all. So my thesis is that uh, we should move to interstate commerce gradually um, by Congress authorizing state licensed equity businesses uh, to engage in interstate commerce first and that we can uh, collect data and look at the evidence and then decide how to move forward rationally. But I think it's really important to get there um, that we understand a few concepts first. So one thing that is so often looked over is that after federal legalization or descheduling, states can still choose to criminalize um, and arrest marijuana users and state and local authority will still stay in place. So um, if you don't like the licensing that takes place now, you probably will still not like it after legalization. So I think it's really important to keep those things in mind as we look forward and to interstate commerce so that we're still being uh, realistic and you're using your own experience. I especially wanna point out if you're in a state that still has prohibition to think through how your state legislature, for example, is likely to react after legalization. And if you are in a state that does have legal cannabis, think through as an analogy, how the cities responded. Were they like, oh, cannabis is legal now, let's be rational about it. Let's figure out how to uh, incorporate it. Some may have. Or did most of them panic and rush to ban and keep marijuana out of uh, their borders? I think it's a very useful way to think about moving forward. So with all of that experience in mind, let's talk about interstate commerce. So the first thing to understand is the Commerce Clause um, and the Dormant Commerce Clause. Don't let those terms intimidate you if you're not a lawyer or even if you are, um, because you'll probably hear it defined four different ways by four different people, which is useful. But what you really need to understand is just that it means Congress has the power to regulate interstate commerce and states do not. So the landmark case here is called Gonzalez v. Rach from 2005. So Angel Rach uh, is a patient, a medical cannabis patient with an inoperable brain tumor. And she uses cannabis she was using it that was given to her by local growers in California, fully compliant with California law. So not only was she not engaging in interstate commerce, she was not even engaging in commerce at all. Yet the decision said that the federal government has the right to reach in and uh, criminalize that behavior based on its power to regulate interstate commerce. Even that non-economic activity uh, has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. So why is that important? Well, that case was notable, not just for people interested in marijuana, but to constitutional scholars as well, because it showed how broad that power is. So now, kind of surreal, we're in the opposite situation where the question is, how can we use that extraordinary potent power for good, I would say, for legalization? And so when it comes to the dormant commerce clause, that just means that the states do not have the power to essentially do what they're doing, which is to ban imported products from other states and to, in some cases, keep out um, out-of-state companies. They don't have that power unless Congress gives it to them. So once you understand that and you think about what we're going to do in the long term with federal legalization, you can kind of see three ways this could move forward. First, um, using that power for good, 
To me, the obvious answer, looking at the purported goals of legalization and the evidence that we have so far, and the importance of timing and head starts, that's what we've seen so much, is that we need to allow equity licensed businesses to go first for the purpose of fairness. So if you want to see what that looks like, you can look at the model bill that Parabola Center put out about a year ago um, outlining how it would work. Now, the second way would be for Congress to just allow things to stay the same by explicitly authorizing states to continue to um, continue to disallow interstate commerce. I don't think that's a great plan. Uh, it's not what I think most people would like if you don't like the current system. Some of these CEOs that are making $4 million a year, they might like that system. I think really the only benefit to it is the simplicity because you're not, if you're scared about giving too much power to the federal government, um, you could just kind of keep things how they are for now. Uh, but the other great thing about it is it prevents the third way, which I would describe as the nightmare scenario, which is essentially Congress not recognizing that they have that power and allowing the default way of moving forward, which would be the dormant commerce clause means that states have to allow interstate commerce and it's basically all left up to corporations and it's a free for all. Uh, I don't think I have to explain too much why that's a nightmare scenario because I think regardless of your political views, you can look around right now and understand why leaving things up to the federal government and corporations doesn't turn out great. And yet all of the federal bills that have been introduced so far by Democrats, Democrats and Republicans are this nightmare scenario. So what I encourage people to do is uh, be proactive. So don't necessarily look at the differences between the bills that have been introduced, but think more about how you could use that power for interstate commerce. So now I wanna talk a bit in my remaining time about the short-term situation. So you'll hear from other speakers about court cases that are ongoing and state efforts to engage in interstate commerce before federal legalization happens. Um, I just wanna say about that, uh, I think it could be good because it's a gradual transition. I think that's uh, what we absolutely need. It could also lead to painful chaos that only benefits big businesses based on the evidence that we've seen. Um, but the most important thing to know is that state equity programs can still move forward, even if interstate commerce is moving forward, because state equity programs do not have to discriminate in favor of in-state residents. We have a whole webinar that we did on that uh, with the DEPC uh, that you can take a look at with more details. Um, with my last minute here, I want to say on a personal note that I think sometimes my models get dismissed or tokenized as like the equity models. And so if you're just kind of waiting and dismissing this idea, I just want to share something personal which is with you, which is that I have a libertarian streak. The one year that I lived in a swing state, I voted for Gary Johnson. I voted libertarian. Um, I have a business degree. I am not someone who just wants more regulations uh, and doesn't believe in, in freedom or competition. The reason I share that is because I want to point out that this position that I've come to is based on a rational analysis of what we've seen since 2012 as the state programs have rolled out. And so if you believe that it is fair to start with the communities that have been harmed by drug prohibition, and most people do, then if you make a rational analysis, you're going to come to the conclusion, I believe, that in order to make this fair, we have to give a start, a head start to equity licensed businesses. And um, by defining it that way, we can give some deference to states in how they define equity because it's going to be different in every place. So that is the model I put forward um, and I hope you enjoy everyone else's. They are also very thoughtful and principled. And once again, thanks to DEPC for putting this on and for elevating the dialogue. Thanks so much, Shaleen. Um, Jeffrey, I will kick it to you next. So please take it away. Great, thanks, Jeremy. And uh, thanks to Shaleen for uh, 
uh, you know, laying out uh, her argument and also defining some of these terms along the way. Um, I would say that uh, one of the big issues with state regulated marijuana commerce is that states are already violating, broadly violating two sets of federal laws. And they imagine that they can excuse one because of the other. Uh, and those two sets are uh, the, of course, the Controlled Substances Act, which uh, it's easy to construe states as aiding and abetting uh, the uh, you know, federal crimes by, by regulating and facilitating uh, you know, commerce and in a Schedule One substance. Uh, the other is systematic violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause. All right, so uh, Shailene talked about the Dormant Commerce Clause a little bit. Uh, but what, you know, and you'll hear more about it after me, but, uh, uh, you know, this is a body of law that's, uh, you know, created through a series of judicial opinions that basically says states do not have the power to, uh, you know, to limit the free movement of capital, people, and goods across state boundaries. Um, this is important because it ensures kind of economic efficiency. Uh, through a, a single nationwide market in which you know consumers and, and producers can compete to uh, to get the best of, of every product that's out there. Um, every state regulatory system in cannabis has some provision that excludes out of state products from entering their state. All right, so that that is kind of a um, uh, you know on, on the surface a a violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause. Now, states think that they are well grounded in doing this because uh, it is a federally illicit good. And they think that they can protect their state markets by uh, you know, saying that the federal government has no jurisdiction to regulate these commercial transactions if they are purely interstate. So if uh, something never leaves their state boundaries. Uh, the federal government doesn't have the reach to go in and arrest people uh, for for following, you know, state guidelines. This, I, I believe, this, uh, you know, this belief that states are hi are hiding behind is unfounded. And and there's a series of court decisions uh, that make that pretty clear. Uh, now, th this this belief has also been reinforced by the Justice Department. Uh, in 2013, under the Obama administration, when James Cole uh, issued the Cole Memorandum, which you know a lot of folks on this call are going to be familiar with, uh, but it gave kind of guidance to U.S. prosecutors nationwide uh, that they should prioritize their enforcement actions uh, against cannabis companies that were basically not in compliance with state laws uh, and, and in systems where. Uh, those state laws didn't protect certain federal priorities like not growing cannabis on federal land and uh, allowing uh, allowing regulated inventory to move from uh, one state to another. Uh, I, I think the the it's it's easy to have gotten um, misled by the Cole memo because first it was never binding on anyone. It was simply a recommendation to U.S. attorneys nationwide. Uh, they could have. Ex exercise their own discretion. And in 2018, uh, during the Trump administration, uh, January 2018, the Cole memo was rescinded anyway. So it's no longer in force. Uh, and Jeff Sessions, when when he rescinded that, and he basically restored the 1980s era uh, priorities for federal enforcement against cannabis. Uh, so, you know, there's, there should be no illusion that uh, this, that, you know, state programs that exclude interstate commerce are somehow protected from federal prosecution. That's simply not true anymore. Um, and as Shailene has, uh, she brought up the Gonzalez versus Rage case, uh, which was heard by the Supreme Court in 2005. Um, that was a case that applied a prior reasoning uh, from the 1930s to marijuana commerce. So uh, in uh, there was a case in the 1930s in which uh, a, a farmer named Roscoe Filburn was growing wheat on his own farm uh, to feed to his pigs and the animals on his farm. Uh, and he got he was fined for doing this uh, because the federal government said that he was violating New Deal era price controls on agricultural commodities. Uh, now, he argued that the federal government had no authority uh, to, to fine him for this. 
because uh, he, there was no commercial transaction involved. It was wheat that he grew on his own farm, uh, never bought or sold to anyone, uh, and certainly never left, left state lines. Uh, it all, all stayed on his farm. Uh, in that case, the court decided that uh, Roscoe Filburn's actions affected the global market or the nationwide market for wheat in the aggregate uh, by depriving his demand from the marketplace. And as such, federal government did have jurisdiction to regulate his actions. Um, and, and so that, uh, you know, libertarians like myself have been, um, uh, have been very critical of the Filburn decision uh, ever since it was issued almost, uh, almost 90 years ago now. Uh, and so when the Rach versus Gonzalez case came up uh, about 15 years ago, uh, you know, libertarians thought this was a this was an opportunity for the court to kind of correct that decision. Uh, but in fact, they doubled down on it. Uh, and they said that, you know, ca that Congress had the authority to uh, to find this woman who was taking medical marijuana for a, a legitimate medical condition in California, even though uh, it was represented non-interstate, non-commerce, all right? So applying the logic of these decisions nationwide today, uh, it becomes very clear that Congress has total authority uh, to regulate any commercial transaction that's happening in any state regulated system right now. Uh, and the DEA or other law enforcement agencies can arrest any dispensary worker, any uh, owner of a cultivation facility. They've just chosen not to, but they unquestionably have the right to do so at this moment. Um, that brings to mind uh, a couple uh, of kind of large questions, right? Like if, if the federal government has the authority uh, to go into any state system today, then are states really um, justified in banning interstate commerce at the present moment. Uh, it certainly seems that, uh, it seems to me at least, that, that this approach is misguided, that they are violating the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, and that that violation is unjustified. In fact, I would argue that, uh, that any state that has legalized marijuana uh, should already be working toward interstate commerce by uh, entering, you know, in whatever technical way they need to do that. You, that's probably going to be uh, by establishing some agreement with other state regulatory systems so that the, uh, the technical packaging and labeling requirements and testing requirements uh, are suitable uh, for regulated inventory to leave one regulated system and enter into another uh, but states certainly do not have the authority to exclude commerce between the between the various states that have allowed a commercial system. Um, I think that the uh, the current you know, state patchwork that excludes interstate commerce unquestionably benefits uh, certain corporate actors, um, uh, primarily those that have been well healed enough to get in early and and procure. Uh, what can be very expensive state licenses, and in some states, licenses have, have traded for as much as forty million dollars. Uh, so, it, you know, just to get the paper in order to uh, be able to begin to set up a business, uh, and then of course you have to invest in physical assets. Uh, so, companies have invested quite a bit of money in order to get into the early state markets and begin to dominate those markets. Uh, as soon as interstate commerce becomes a viable option. Uh, the, those investments and the assets that those companies hold will be endangered because uh, you know it's it's cheaper to uh, to grow high quality cannabis products in a place that has uh, favorable conditions like Northern California or Oregon uh, than it is to do in an artificially constructed environment uh, like a warehouse in Illinois, for instance. Uh, so you know there are there are clearly some some parties that uh, will continue to oppose interstate commerce uh, at at both the state and the federal levels. Um, with you know I at, along with the Reason Foundation are party to an organization called the Cannabis Freedom Alliance, which is behind a, a congressional proposal called the States Reform Act, uh, which would open up interstate commerce. 
uh, and allow the Treasury Department to regulate transfers, regulate in inventory between uh, the various state systems. I do think that it is in everyone's best interest that uh, we get to interstate commerce in a way that is uh, thoughtful and guided by legislation. Uh, but even barring that eventuality, uh, I believe that states need to be working today uh, toward opening up their state markets. And with that, I'll pass it on. Thank you so much, Jeff. Appreciate all the perspective there. Scott, you are up next. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. And let me just uh, start just by quickly thanking Shailene and Doug and everyone else at the Ohio State DEPC. And it pains me to say the Ohio State because I, I went to Michigan. Nonetheless, they, they invited me to this panel. So thank you so much for inviting me. And I also just want to, again, thank uh, Shailene and also Jeremy, Jeff, and Adam for, for engaging in this conversation today. Um, and as someone who's probably the newest face on, on the panel, I, I'm just really honored to be uh, a part of the conversation. So, so thank you for that. Um, so yeah, so I'm a professor uh, at uh, University of Maine School of Law uh, here in Portland, Maine. And uh, as is relevant to this panel, I teach constitutional law and cannabis law. Um, and so my kind of insight, the, the niche that I bring uh, to this panel comes at, at the intersection of those two subjects. And there, there are two main points that I want to make um, about, about the intersection of constitutional law and cannabis law uh, as it pertains to this issue of interstate commerce. So the, the first is that I think that when Congress eventually legalizes marijuana, it should create a temporary transition period to interstate commerce and marijuana and during this temporary transition period, states could choose whether and to what extent they want to keep their marketplaces insular and state-based or open up uh, for, uh, for interstate commerce. Um, and the alternative to, to this uh, kind of transition period is what Shailene called the nightmare scenario, um, where uh, basically legalization because of the Dormant Commerce Clause has the effect of instantly invalidating every state's restrictions on interstate commerce and cannabis, as well as a bunch of other uh, restrictions that may have the effect of, of burdening uh, out of state uh, cannabis businesses, would invalidate these uh, overnight and basically force states to instantly open up the doors to interstate commerce. So that's point number one I want to get into is that I think there should be a transition period from the current insular state-based system into uh, the system of interstate commerce. And the second and perhaps more, more important point I want to get into um, is that I want to make sure that interstate commerce and marijuana comes about through considered legislative judgment and not through ad hoc judicial decree. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. Um, so let me let me start though by unpacking the first point I, I made about this transition period. So you've heard about the dormant commerce clause. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. I'm probably alone with like 25 other nerdy law professors uh, when I say that. Um, but I like talking about the dormant commerce clause. I and I like writing about it too. Um, so last year, just just about a year ago now. Um, I co-authored a law review article with a professor named Rob Mykos from, from Vanderbilt Law. Um, and the article is called Legalization Without Disruption, Why Congress Should Let States Restrict Interstate Commerce and Marijuana. You can read it if you Google legalization without disruption. It'll be like the first thing that pops up. And in the article, we thank you, Shailene, for, for sending that link. I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, and so in the article, we explain how, you know, the moment that the federal government legalizes marijuana, every state that prevents marijuana from being traded uh, across state lines, as well as other state laws, are going to become unconstitutional. And to make a long story short, that's because of the Dormant Commerce Clause, which, as you have heard, prevents states from restricting interstate commerce. And right now, because marijuana is federally illegal, 
uh, states have operated on the assumption that they can restrict interstate trade in marijuana without violating the Dormant Commerce Clause doctrine. Jeff laid out an argument for, for why he thinks that's wrong. Uh, I happen to mostly disagree with that and uh, that argument, and we can, we can get into that in a bit. Um, but regardless of whether uh, the current uh, state, state insular state market structure violates the Dormant Commerce Clause, there's no question that as soon as marijuana is no longer federally illegal, this marketplace stru place structure will violate the Dormant, Com Dormant Commerce Clause uh, it, it, unless, unless Congress does one specific thing when it legalizes marijuana, which is to suspend the Dormant Commerce Clause. And that's what uh, Professor Mikos and I uh, proposed doing in the paper. We proposed that Congress tempor temporarily suspend the Dormant Commerce Clause. So first of all, like, what does it mean to suspend the Dormant Commerce Clause? It's a weird thing to say because like, Congress can't just, I don't know, suspend the Equal Protection Clause or suspend your free speech rights or suspend the requirement that you have to be 35 years old to be elected president. There's no other you know, provision of the Constitution that Congress can just suspend. But the Supreme Court has recognized uh, that Congress does have the power to suspend the Dormant Commerce Clause. And the basic reasoning uh, behind that is that the Constitution empowers Congress to regulate interstate commerce, right? Congress, not the states. And one way Congress might choose to regulate interstate commerce is to say that, you know what, uh, for this, for the market in, in widgets or whatever, we think the best way to have uh, interstate commerce is, is to let states restrict it if they want. Right? And, and so Congress can pass a law suspending the Dormant Commerce Clause as to a particular industry or good or service. So why do uh, wh why did Professor Mikos and I write this article and propose that Congress temporarily suspend the Dormant Commerce Clause when it legalizes marijuana? There were two reasons. The first right, is that we didn't think many people really understood the effect that federal legalization would have on the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, I mean, the Dormant Commerce Clause, while I like writing and talking about it, it's a pretty arcane doctrine of constitutional law. Um, and it's not really the first thing people tend to think about when they think about legalizing marijuana. And so we didn't want to see interstate commerce and marijuana happen on accident, right? Like we want to make sure that uh, if and when uh, and how interstate commerce comes about, Right, it's a product of informed decision making from policymakers and reformers and, and business folks, etc., um, who understood that uh, the the result of federal legalization would be the sudden invalidation of insular state marketplaces uh, unless Congress suspends the Dormant Commerce Clause. Right, so that's reason number one. We want to bring some awareness to the issue, and the second reason is we just didn't think that the overnight change, the sudden change from the current marketplace system to a system of uh, unfettered interstate commerce was an ideal way to make that transition. We thought, we thought it should be more gradual and we should have a period where states can choose whether and to what extent to participate in interstate commerce, right? Um, and so there, there are a lot of reasons we argued why this transition period would be useful, but to kind of um, boil it down, um, the, the, the big benefit, right, is it gives Congress and it gives federal regulators and it gives state policymakers time to put rules in place to create a fair and equitable national marketplace before we just throw open the doors to, inter to unfettered interstate commerce. Right, uh, it, it gives uh, federal regu regulators time to create basic rules of the roads for engaging in interstate commerce, uh, to uh, put, put measures in place that would uh, prevent hyper consolidation or a race to the bottom where states are slashing important health and safety and environmental regulations and even wages 
uh, to try to attract cannabis businesses and things like that. But right? it gives time to create a more orderly transition, a more equitable transition to interstate commerce. Right. So that's point number one that I think Congress should suspend the dormant commerce clause temporarily for a set period of time in order to create this transition period. And point number two, right, as I said, is that uh, interstate commerce and marijuana should come about through considered leg legislative judgment and not by some court deeming it to be so, right? So what I mean by that is this, right? Maybe Congress sits down to write a legalization bill and it takes a careful look at, at my proposal to sus temporarily suspend the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, and it decides not to do that. Right? It takes a look at all the, all the relevant data, it meets with the stakeholders, all that, and it says, you know what, we're just gonna rip off the Band-Aid and go straight to interstate commerce. Or maybe it goes the other way and decides, you know what, we're actually gonna suspend the Dormant Commerce Clause indefinitely and just maintain this insular state-based system forever. Um, I, I might disagree with those approaches, right? But at least, at least those approaches were the product of like the legislature functioning as a legislature and, and you know, representing us and, and making laws after engaging in, in the relevant process, right? That's, that's how the system is supposed to work. And if the result that comes out isn't specifically what I want, like, so be it, right? But the other way we might get to interstate commerce and marijuana is the way that, that Jeff was, was getting at, right? Where a court decides that the dormant commerce clause actually uh, prevents states from restricting interstate trade in marijuana right now, right? Even, even while there is a uh, federal prohibition of marijuana. Um, and, and this is an argument, right? That we're starting to see in lawsuits that are challenging residency restrictions, right? So restrictions on who can own a marijuana business. Uh, some states have said it has to be only residents or that residents get some sort of favored treatment. And the majority of courts to look at this have, have decided, yeah, the Dormant Commerce Clause applies and, and states you can't, you can't prevent non-residents from owning marijuana businesses. So um, I don't actually totally disagree with that, uh, with that result in the context of residency restrictions, but I do think interstate restrictions on interstate, interstate trade are meaningfully different, right? We can get in, into why that is, um, but I think it's a different issue than the residency restrictions. And what I don't want to see happen is courts take the result, courts who take the result in the residency restriction context and use that precedent to start invalidating state restrictions on interstate trade, because then we're going to have this patchwork system where some courts are invalidating it in some states and there's going to be no federal rules in place. There won't be really any pre-existing state plans in, in place for interstate trade. And it'll just be interstate trade through ad hoc judicial decree. And I think we need to be more careful in how we plan it out. Thank you so much, Scott. Last but not least, I will kick it over to Adam. Hello, um, thank you so much. And thank you, Shaleen, for inviting me and for, um, for the Ohio State University uh, DCP for hosting this event. Uh, my name is Adam Smith, and I run an organization called the Alliance for Sensible Markets. And we have been working very specifically for the last three years on opening up uh, the opportunity for commerce between consenting states, as we like to say, um, in advance of federal legalization. Um, I want to start by saying that I sh I share the the distrust I guess or the the lack of confidence um, in Congress uh, to do this right uh, with I think all of the other panelists uh, and the dangers of having uh, the federal government come in and and just tear off the band aid or or open up commerce um, you know non thoughtfully uh, so let me tell you how we got here. It, in 2018, I was running an organization called the called the Craft Cannabis Alliance, and we were organizing uh, locally owned uh, businesses, farms, and businesses that were that were majority owned here in Oregon, uh, that were values driven, um, in order to lift up 
uh, the idea of this of this local economy. In Oregon, when we legalized cannabis, we did something that was, I think, very wise uh, and very Oregonian, which is that we tried to legalize the industry we already had. Uh, we had had 20 years of medical uh, cannabis with registered producers. Um, we had a, a dispensary system. And, uh, and so we made licenses cheap and unlimited. And the state actually ran a marketing campaign called Go Legal. And, you know, and, and the message was, uh, not, you know, bring in your Canadian public money and buy up all these farms. It was, we know that you're producing, we know that you're growing, whether you're registered medical or unregulated, please come into the legal market. And, and a lot of people did that. People put everything on the line. Um, and this is mostly small farmers uh, in Southern Oregon. And, and we did that because uh, cannabis had always been a really important economic driver in some of the poorest parts of our state. Uh, and that, you know, that a whole bunch of legacy communities of legacy producing communities had depended upon this economy for literally for generations. And so we wanted to bring that production industry, uh, which is, you know, among the best in the world, into the legal market. And so folks put up their farms and their houses and they borrowed money and they, and they you know, went through the expense of getting legal. But what we didn't really think through is when we legalized the industry we had in Oregon, the industry we had was an export industry and had always been an export industry. Most of the cannabis grown here had always left the state. Um, you know, we have 4 million people here, uh, a, a not insignificant percentage of whom get their, um, get their cannabis from their friends or grow it themselves. And so it's a small market, but, uh, but we are a, a prolific producer of, of terrific and uh, environmentally sustainably grown and, and, um, and efficiently grown cannabis. And so, uh, and so in around 2018, uh, 2017 18 we hit a glut of product um and all all the um political leaders here were talking about well this is you know a terrible oversupply problem we have a terrible oversupply problem but the problem is when you think thought about it as an oversupply problem the answers they came to all hurt producers how do we have fewer farmers how do we make them grow less um and but really what we had was not an oversupply problem it was a market access problem if if the farmers here in, in southern oregon could access the markets they had traditionally served, we would need every ounce of cannabis we could grow under current licensure and everyone could make a living and we could save, you know, a thousand farms and, and, and a ton of small businesses. And so we put a bill together uh, for the 2019 session that allows Oregon to enter into interstate agreements uh, for the purpose of commerce and cannabis. Um, and, uh, and we passed it with bipartisan support and the governor's support. And in that bill, we had a federal trigger. Um, and it said that Oregon can enter into these agreements as soon as the federal government either allows commerce via statute, oh, sorry about that, either allows commerce via statute or indicates tolerance through a Department of Justice memo or policy statement. And that was, that was really the key piece, right? It was, you know, we've waited a long time, uh, you know, for Congress. And, and I can say after a lot of years in drug policy reform, and now more specifically cannabis, that waiting for Congress to fix cannabis has never been a winning strategy, right? That, that has not happened. It has always been the states that have moved forward. And, and we believe pretty strongly that commerce would be, uh, would follow the same path, right? As, as has been um, touched on by everyone who has spoken so far, um, uh, you know, all of this progress has happened because the states have decided to move into cannabis, whether it's medical or adult use, and the Department of Justice, you know, through the Cole Memo and now through the statements of uh, of Attorney General of Attorney General Merrick Garland, you know, has been we're going to keep our hands off. If you are operating under state regulation, uh, we are not going to spend resources to come after you. Uh, and again, it wasn't binding under Cole, but it had that effect. Um, and today, uh, not uh, Attorney General Garland has uh, testified in front of Congress saying exactly that, where the states are regulating, we don't see that as a priority. And so we passed this bill in Oregon, uh, and then, and, and the idea was to get Oregon and California, and we now, there's now a bill in California, and I'll talk about that in a second, is to get the governors of the producer states to seek guidance from the Department of Justice. What would DOJ do if two or more medical or adult use states decided to create a regulatory framework for commerce? And Given and while you know Attorney General's uh, bar and sessions were no friends of the cannabis industry, um, we have a very different uh, we have a very different political situation now. We have a president 
and, and an attorney general who have both said the same things. We are leaving this up to the states. And as has also been touched on, there is no difference under interstate commerce in, the, in federal jurisdiction over entirely intrastate markets versus markets that actually uh, bring product you know, back and forth against state lines. They all fall under federal jurisdiction under the Commerce Clause. Uh, it's all in violation of the Controlled Substances Act. And it's all happening because the Department of Justice has decided to stay hands off. Um, and so there's a bill right now in California, um, which is uh, Senate Bill 1326, uh, which is as of right now through uh, the Senate and through committee in the House and will go after recess uh, to appropriations and then to the floor. And we believe that that bill is going to pass. And it, it's very similar to the Oregon bill. Um, it, uh, it allows the state to enter into agreements. Um, they're, they're, we are still haggling over the final federal trigger language, but it will almost certainly require, uh, it will almost certainly require an ask of DOJ uh, for guidance. And we think that, and what we have done is we have pulled together a coalition through the Alliance that is prepared, especially, you know, as soon as this California bill goes through and is signed by Governor Newsom, which we believe it will be, to ask Governors Brown and Newsom of Oregon and California, uh, and also Senator, um, Governor Inslee and Governor Polis of Washington, Colorado, to make this request of the Department of Justice. So why do we think it's important to get interstate commerce going now and, and under this system? Well, first, um, as has been, again, mentioned by the other speakers, uh, states need an opportunity to decide whether to open their markets. Uh, under a, a state opt-in, they could do that. We can keep uh, relevant small business and equity protections in place. Um, and excuse me. And, uh, and states that wanted to keep their, their markets closed could do that until federal legalization uh, force them open or not, depending on how Congress treats the Commerce Clause. Um, right now in Oregon and California and specifically, there are thousands of small businesses um, that have been, uh, that are in legacy producing communities that are on the verge of, of collapse. They are going out of business at, a, at an alarming rate um, because they're not accessing markets. Uh, California's got somewhat different problems. They have a larger population, but other problems with uh, taxes that they're trying to, that they're trying to address. Uh, and licensing of retail. But in any case, this is the area that has supplied, uh, you know, 80 or 90% of the domestically grown cannabis uh, going back 50 years for the country. But what about on the consumer side, right? And, and I, I should clarify that there is no interest, there is no push to open up the market between Oregon and California, right? Trading, you know, $100 a, a pound cannabis back and forth over that border is not going to help anyone. This is about opening the possibility of bringing in a medical or adult use state that is not advantaged in terms of production uh, in order to help get their industries up and off the ground with a steady world-class and competitive supply chain um, years faster, uh, moving potentially millions of consumers and patients out of illicit markets years sooner. And, um, and, uh, and in those states, what we are doing right now, when we talk about the transition that is likely to come, if, if Congress rips the Band-Aid off, um, in those states, we are, mis, uh, we are misincentivizing mass production in places where it will probably never be competitive. So that when the, the Commerce Clause does kick in and, uh, and states are no longer allowed to keep their, their markets siloed, a lot of that production, a giant percentage of that production is going to become pretty instantly non-competitive, right? Whereas the other levels of trade in those states, whether that's retail, distribution, delivery, product development, manufacturing, wellness, hospitality, are all sitting often for years waiting for a supply chain to emerge in their states. And that supply chain is going to be limited and overpriced based on how much it costs to grow every ounce of cannabis you need to grow if you have to grow it indoors for a state. And so, you know, our goal as the Alliance for Sensible Markets is to help usher in uh, an industry that is as broadly beneficial as possible with thousands of, of businesses making a living rather than you know, six boardrooms dominating uh, supply in the industry. Um, and to do that in a way uh, that is accountable to the history of prohibition and the communities that have suffered uh, under it to get us to this point. And so um, Shaleen mentioned, and, and I have written about the possibility of consumer states in particular, um, giving you know, priority to equity licensees 
uh, to conduct interstate commerce first. Um, and, and I think that's a really interesting idea. I also believe that we have a lot more um, traction and, and we have regulators that are a lot more clued in at the state level than we do right now at the federal level. And that states setting up um, an interstate framework is likely to be something that is much more reality-based and much more uh, manageable for the small businesses in those states than waiting for the feds to come in and start to regulate commerce from zero and hoping we get a, a good outcome. Um, so I will leave it there. We have plenty to talk about. And uh, thanks again for having me. Thanks so much, Adam. Really appreciate it. Um, in the interest of time, I will dive right into our questions. Appreciate all the panelists coming with their super thoughtful perspectives. So I wanted to work from first principles. Let's say this is a physics problem, right? Um, there are a lot of different ideas about what to do to legalize cannabis in a fair way. But all of that stems from the initial question, what is the goal of cannabis legalization? Is it economic opportunity? Is it to help businesses make money? Is it to re rectify the harms of the war on drugs? Like, what are we doing here? And how do we sort of start thinking about it from that top-down framework? Um, maybe, Scott, I can start with you, and then whoever wants to chime in next can go ahead, or I'll um, kick it to someone individually afterward. Sure. Uh, so I'll be brief. I, I don't think there is a singular goal. I think there are multiple goals of legalization, but I do think that the paramount goal uh, should, should be rectifying the harms of the war on drugs. And part of that is building literal equity in the cannabis industry and ensuring that the people, the families, the communities who have been most hurt by the disastrous policy of federal prohibition uh, have a stake in the marijuana industry and, and also frankly can use marijuana uh, without you know, facing the threat of uh, arrest or other forms of loss of federal benefits. Sorry, I was on mute there. Adam, I saw you nodding along. I will uh, kick it over to you next. No, I mean, I, I think that uh, I, I think that says it. Like I said, I think that we 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 have a, an ethical responsibility and an economic responsibility um, to 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 help you know to create an industry that is accountable to its history. And uh, you know, you can't talk about this industry without talking about um, you know millions of people arrested and in jail. Uh, communities that were disproportionately targeted, uh, nor the the communities um, that are largely white in in the Pacific Northwest that were you know growing most of the cannabis that were also targets of of state and federal law enforcement, um, and and out of that out of that came a lot of the activism uh, that brought us here and got us to an industry. And if we end up, you know, I, I you know my name is Adam Smith. I'm a capitalist. Uh, there's a place in this industry for businesses large and small. Um, but, it, but if this industry, which it very well could, ends up being a dozen boardrooms um, dominating everything and crumbs for everyone else, uh, we will have failed. And I think we have one shot to get that through uh, federally. I think if, the, if Congress does it wrong, and, and I am of the opinion that it's likely that they will do it wrong, um, that that's where we could end up. And I think that has to be avoided. Shailene, that seems like a good place for you to jump in. Yeah, I don't know if I can put it any more concisely than, than Scott did. I agree. Um, I think there is a singular goal and the singular goal is respecting the dignity of cannabis users. And going along with that means stopping them from arrest, but also creating a whole market. And we need to create that market in a historically informed way. And that encompasses what Scott and Adam have said. Jeffrey, please. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't disagree with any of that, but I think, you know, the overriding goal of legalization is uh, to correct a mistake. Uh, prohibition never should have happened in the first place, right? Uh, if you go back to the days of Perry Hanslinger, they were, uh, you know, they were promoting a lot of lies and misrepresentations in order to uh, get prohibition put in place uh, so that some federal bureaucrats who had just been, who were at risk of getting laid off because alcohol prohibition was ending, would continue to have their same jobs. Um, and, and prohibition generally, no matter what the substance, it just doesn't work, right? It makes markets, if as long as there's a popular demand for a product, 
by banning the supply, it just makes markets more dangerous because it push, uh, pushes everything underground uh, where people don't have access to the court systems to resolve disputes and things like that. Uh, and so things get violent. You know, society, as, uh, as a result of prohibition, I believe is a lot more violent today than it would be otherwise. And uh, I think we see the, the most prominent manifestation of that along our southern border where there are you know, drug cartels and traffickers uh, who commit major acts of violence almost on a daily basis. Okay, so thinking about that, and, and again, please feel free to jump in um, if you have a point to say, but um, thinking about that a little bit, what right now isn't working? We, we've heard a lot of different perspectives about strategies to fix the problem, but what specifically is not working in this sort of pseudo prohibition that uh, we still live under today in the US? Um, Adam, start with you. Uh, well, I mean, I think if we look at, uh, if, if we look at the economics, uh, on the West Coast, what's not working is is we're really driving um, the the soul of this business of this industry out of business, right? The small producers, uh, of which there are thousands on the West Coast, and then in the limited license states where production is uh, uh, most, you know, in, in states where it basically all has to happen indoors, uh, we are advantaging a few large companies who can come in with fifty million dollars, build giant facilities, uh, get quickly through the licensing uh, and compliance issues and get up and running um, where they have sort of artificial state protections. Uh, the smaller producers in those states take a lot longer to license. Um, and so for the time being, um, you have essentially an oligarchy uh, that can last years that is, you know, that is harming everyone else downstream in the industry, but is also setting this up uh, so that we're going to wipe a lot of, uh, a lot of folks out um, in parts of the industry that should be sustainable in those places. Again, retail distribution delivery. Um, you know, while we're waiting for them to have access to thousands of suppliers, um, you know, that would make them a lot more competitive. Shalene, you touched on this, obviously, in your introduction here, but I'd love some specifics. I mean, what specifically isn't working? How is it affecting the folks that you work with and have worked at in your past jobs as well? Um, so I, I totally agree with Adam about the oligarchy, no question. Um, but my my fear is that if we move forward in the wrong way with legalization, we will go to even smaller oligarchy or a monopoly. I think a key question is, if you think that state policy is going in the right direction, which I do, then what is the biggest problem right now that can't be solved at the state level? And for me, that's two things. One is um, the court splits that we have is putting are putting uh, medical cannabis patients in an untenable situation. Um, children who have seizures that have been uh, prescribed medication that works for them, they can't take it at school um, in a lot of states. We have people who have been um, harmed in accidents and they can't get their medicine by workers compensation or insurance. So those are all things that have to be solved at the federal level and it doesn't even need to be under descheduling or legalization, it could be done incrementally. In the same way, a big problem that we have is that people are still locked up for cannabis when they shouldn't be, virtually everyone agrees they shouldn't be. And that's something that, for example, Biden could fix through mass pardons. So I think there's a lot of problems um, that could be solved at the state level or without descheduling if we're not ready for it. Scott, go ahead. Yeah, so maybe I'll just build a little bit on the, the point about oligopolies or the, the oligo oligopolistic marketplace structure that's in place in, in many states. Um, so to me, I think a lot of this is a is a cons is actually stems from federal prohibition, right? It's like the especially early mover states wanted to make sure that they were creating these tightly regulated uh, insular environments, and they thought that the way to do that one way to do that um, was to like limit the number of companies that they would have to regulate and and you know uh, uh, police um, and uh, you know a more cynical view is just like they wanted to create a structure that would benefit big businesses. The truth maybe is somewhere in between those. I'm not sure, um, but it's clear to me that that licensing structure doesn't work. It needs it needs to change. Um, I'm a strong supporter of. Uh, either entirely removing or significantly raising overall licensing caps. Um, 
And then just kind of related to that, like there's, there's another point that gets overlooked a little bit, which is that overall licensing caps, while I think largely they should be done away with, they're not inherently problematic, right? What they're problematic when they're combined with criteria that allows, you know, big businesses to, to get the, the licenses. If they're exclusive to social equity um, applicants or other small businesses, if they're appropriate uh, caps in place on uh, either like the number of licenses someone can own or something like that, and if, and if the overall cap is sufficiently high, um, then it's not necessarily problematic to have them. Jeffrey, before I kick it over to you, I just wanted to um, follow up quickly on one point that Scott made. Um, thinking about the criteria of those licensing structures, Scott, how would you change what's being written if you want to take a state like New York, for example, which is trying very hard to write the license criteria in a way that benefits social equity applicants, um, but oftentimes because of federal prohibition, there's no access to loans, uh, they don't have investors in their network, and so however good these regulations are written, they often get taken advantage of, which is something we report again. So are there any sort of fixes in mind that you have that would sort of work across different states with obviously different demogra demographics, economic situations, and things like that? Uh, sorry, was that question for me or for Jeff? Sorry, for I wanted to direct it to you and then have Jeff uh, uh, sort of parry off that. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I think specifics would probably vary by state, but the overall thing is, is lowering barriers of entry and whatever can be done to lower barriers of entry is going to help small businesses and social equity owned um, businesses. The other thing, and I'm, I wanna, I'm just gonna throw an idea out there because this is a panel and we're just here to chat. Um, and I don't necessarily endorse the idea, but it's something I've been thinking of is um, you know, kind of the role home grow plays in the overall market and whether there's an opportunity to expand home grow to allow some sort of limited sale, either direct to consumer or to uh, retailers or manufacturers. Um, and to, you know, because what, what lowers barriers of entry more than just allowing somebody to have a little operation from their home. It's like a micro micro license or something like that. Jeffrey, I'll, I'll uh, pivot back to you. The original question around some of the problems that arise from state federal conflict, as well as um, Scott's point about fixing the criteria about the licensing structures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think there are two big problems. One, I, I think I share with a couple other folks on here is the limited licensing. Um, it unquestionably benefits the well healed uh, and, and promotes corruption within the industry. Uh, if you look at Nevada as an example of a place where there's documented corruption, where uh, regulators accepted bribes from applicants in order to uh, to win a license. Um, I, I think limited licensing also impinges on social equity. Uh, the best thing for uh, those who don't have huge endowments of capital is uh, is to have a market that is uh, uh, that is easy to get into and inexpensive. Uh, so you know, cheap licenses um, that have kind of very standard criteria. Uh, and an unlimited number. We don't limit the number of liquor retailers in most states, uh, for instance. Uh, we don't limit the number of grocery stores, gas stations. The market kind of is, is the, norm, the natural regulator, just the, the, the amount of demand that is out there. Um, so there, there's no like market reason why we need to have limited licenses. Uh, it's, I think it's a legislative reason uh, driven by some lobbying interests. Uh, the, the other thing that I think is a big shortcoming with the current system is uh, we think we can fund every pet project imaginable at the state and local level uh, through taxes on cannabis. Um, ta some, in some states do okay, but in some states, cannabis taxes are insane. Uh, you know, I, I recently did a study looking at uh, the effective tax rates across California and varies by jurisdiction because, you know, there are various different local levies. Uh, but, you know, the effective tax rate per pound ranges anywhere from $700 to $1,300 uh, in California. That's more than the cost of production. Um, that, <laughs> at that point, you're, you're basically guaranteeing that the black market is going to continue to thrive uh, because consumers, you know, those supply chains are well established, have been around for 90 years, right? Consumers know how to get lower cost 
uh, illicit goods if you're going to price them out of the legal market. Uh, so I, you know, I think having rational, reasonable tax rates uh, is a very important component of legalization. Can I jump in there? Please, yeah, go ahead. Um, so agreeing with the uh, past two speakers, um, I'm a big fan of analogies. So I wanna point out a couple of things that we could look at to address those issues. One is I think Maine is a great example of state regulations that are fair, that are open, that have low barriers to entry. And if you look at their caregiver model, potentially could uh, implement some of what Scott was suggesting in terms of home grow. Um, I think Massachusetts is a good example of uh, at the state level where you have no limits on licenses at the state level, but there are limits on how many, uh, how much in the market one person can own or control. So we could certainly do that at the federal level. You could have a certain number of federal permits. And once you reach your limit across the country, then you're done. I mean, a lot of that is in the execution. So it's good to learn from places like Massachusetts, but my last point here is there's an analogy for what could go terribly wrong, because if you look at mass, you need both a state and a local permit. And the local permit has been a wildly corrupt uh, process. We had another person who was arrested by the FBI last month uh, for trying to bribe a local official. And so if you think about limited license states, and then a corporate federal free-for-all and someone potentially going in and buying up all of these limited licenses, uh, we've got a big problem on our hands. Shaleen, to follow it up and to kind of touch back on, on what you discussed earlier, how, how far can state power go to remedy some of these issues, right? Um, especially on the business formation side, there's only so much a state can do to change its laws, to force you know, a bank to underwrite a loan or to, or to give line of credit or, or to, um, as you just mentioned, to sort of reevaluate how these municipal practices run, um, corrupt town councils and things like that. So how far can state power go without the federal government getting involved or without Congress uh, writing a new bill? Yeah, I think we're really seeing the limits of that right now, aren't we? We'll especially see it in New York. I think um, when you have loans that are being made from a state, um, I, I, yeah, I think we're seeing the limits of it and it is concerning for companies that are violating state law. Obviously 280E is a big problem for companies as well. So some of these things will be automatically solved by federal legalization, but you have to weigh it against um, the potential problems. Anyone else like to jump in there or shall I uh, move on? Okay. so. Looking at, um, speaking of Congress and looking at legislation that is already around, um, there are some specific pieces of legislation that have been tried and, and failed multiple times, the Safe Banking Act, which is a relatively narrow banking bill. Um, there are sort of other bills from the progressive wing that go much further. Uh, Republicans, a freshman congressman, Nancy Mace, has her own legalization bill. Um, I, I wanted you all to sort of weigh or evaluate the merits of these bills and what approaches may be able to work, um, especially given that, uh, you know, there are midterms coming up and the balance of Congress could shift. Um, so maybe, Adam, we'll start with you and then we can uh, go go down the line. I believe you're on mute. <laughs> yeah. Can you repeat the question? So yeah, I, I would like to, to evaluate the merits of the sort of oh. bills that are uh, right. are being bandied about right now and, and how they could be fixed. Or changed. I mean, I don't, I, I am not a big fan of any, I mean, I'm hopeful on banking and I'm hoping we can attach uh, some equity language to that. But in terms of the legalization bills, uh, I'm not a big fan of any of them. Uh, I think the the CSOA came out and, and uh, uh, you know, initially, and if they're going to put it out again, but it was you know, wildly overreaching and, and, you know, look like a disaster to a ton of people in the industry. And I, I think it would be, um, uh, you know, which is why, you know, our goal for the last three years has been to avoid Congress entirely, right? I mean, there are problems with, with, with state laws, right? You can look at Proposition 64 and going back, they would have done that differently. But California is working really hard to try to, um, try to ameliorate some of that. They just had a big victory on 
uh, on reducing taxes. And while some people say it's not enough, um, the state understands uh, the state regulators and, and the administration and, and the state uh, legislature understands, you know, in large measure, the problems that the industry is having, and they have a they have a real incentive to help make that industry uh, viable and to make it broadly beneficial. And so, um, while the you know, so I'm super encouraged by a lot of stuff that's happening in the states, uh, and I and I would actually hope that we could let the states continue to take the lead. I am not in any. You know, while legalization would solve potentially some problems, I'm not in any rush to put push through legalization at this point. Given what we've seen come out of Congress, I think um, I think it misses way too much, and that they don't have the the, the capacity or even the competence right now uh, to come in with a state with a federal legislative fix and do better than the states than where the states are headed potentially. Scott, I'll kick it to you next, and you also touched on that point about sort of. <laughs> looking at the competency of uh, who's writing these bills and, and what that means for uh, the actual intent of the bills itself. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think I agree with Adam where I'm not in love with any of the current legalization proposals. I'd say there's elements of uh, each bill that I, that I like. Um, there's, you know, in the, the MORE Act and in the CAOA, there's some good social equity provisions in there. I don't think they're enough. Uh, but they're they're at least included, um, and the CAOA does have like a couple of uh, market structuring rules to prevent uh, bribery and exclusivity agreements, um, and those those rules uh, are you know one step toward preventing the sort of like hyper consolidated national oligopoly that I think we all fear. Um, in in the in the state reform acts, I should say I I I kind of like the uh, like cultivation model in there where the, the uh, I guess Department of Agriculture basically would create a federal floor uh, and states, you know, have to submit plans that comply with that floor or go beyond that floor. I, I, I like the concept of just having um, a kind of federal regulatory floor to, to make sure that, you know, there are some rules of the road, basic rules of the road for interstate commerce, um, but I, but none of the, to get back to kind of my big issue here is none of them provide uh, for a temporary suspension of the dormant commerce clause. And so I think that the transition period um, from the insular marketplace structure to the interstate market uh, is gonna be problematic and is gonna cause uh, a lot of uh, consolidation and uh, will not be a fair market structure for small businesses. Thanks, Scott. Shalene, I'll go to you next. Um, and also to keep in mind Scott's point about, uh, you know, to use sort of a ham-fisted metaphor about ripping the Band-Aid too quickly, um, what, what this means and, and what the harms of that could, could be, um, you know, as states and, and the federal government try and figure this out. Yeah, um, well, I'll point out one thing that I like in one bill because I saw Jeff pointed out and I think he's totally right, which is the way that the state's reform act um, requires the SBA to make lending uh, on the same terms for everyone and prevent discrimination. I think that's a, a great key thing that's maybe been overlooked. Um, in general, these bills are trash. They're terrible. You can see from all of us being very different, um, but still having expertise that we agree on so much. And there's no reason why we haven't seen a bill with at least the thing that things that most people agree on. And I think that as time goes on, you see so much more corporate influence than we had at the state level, at, at least with the first bills that have largely been copy and pasted. In the federal arena, you're seeing bills that as time goes on, the difference between reality versus what's in the bill and what's in the talking points is getting bigger and bigger. Um, the last example was the Climb Act, which was just introduced. The press release said the phrase small and minority owned businesses five times, but the actual bill 
um, lets cannabis companies be listed on stock exchange and that's not even mentioned in the press release. So that's just an example of where we're going. And what I really would hope to see from all of the very smart people who are attending is that you take this discussion and it's an impetus for you to be more proactive in what we wanna see for federal, le federal legislation, whether it's incremental or whether it goes all the way to descheduling and not just being reactive to a bunch of trash bills. All right, you want me to jump Jeff, in? please. Yeah, please go. All right. <laughs> um, all right. So I think uh, there, there are components of the MORE Act that I like. Um, you know, it's uh, it's got uh, it's a very simple bill. Basically, it allows kind of states to do what they want. Um, it imposes an eight percent excise tax. Um, but there's a big weakness with the MORE Act is there's uh, there's no regulatory structure built into it. It's all left to rulemaking. Right, so we don't know what it's what would it actually look like. Um, I'm biased, but uh, uh, because I've been involved with the states reform act since the beginning, uh, but I, I think that's one of the key advantages it has. It, it's very express in the way it sets forth the, what the regulatory structure is supposed to look like. Uh, it uh, gives the uh, you know secretary of treasury a very limited time frame to stand up regulations uh, in order to get that system put into place. Uh, and it imposes a very reasonable 3% federal excise tax. Uh, you know, I, th I think it's important to bear in mind that any federal tax is going to uh, be layered on top of existing state and local taxes. Uh, so in, in my mind, that's the, the that's really the thing that makes this CAOA, uh, which is Senator Schumer's bill, unworkable, uh, at least in the version that we've seen of it, because it has a 25% federal excise tax. Uh, that's later on top of existing state and local taxes. Um, no one's going to purchase legal marijuana if that's if that's the case. Uh, so you know, I, I think at, at, at a minimum, the tax rate would have to come down uh, in order for that to be feasible. Uh, another big advantage the States Reform Act has is uh, it requires an automatic expungement of all past uh, cannabis convictions. Uh, if they were nonviolent in nature. So, you know, if, if somebody wasn't a member of a cartel, they weren't shooting a gun uh, while they were purchasing cannabis, uh, everything would be expunged. Uh, and everyone then would become, uh, who might be currently incarcerated, they'd be let out, they, and they would gain the ability to apply for a federal cannabis license uh, at, a, at a very reasonable rate. So they can go back and use their knowledge and participate in the industry. And, and like Shalene said, they, they can apply for a small business administration loan. Uh, so, you know, it, I, I think it, the States Reform Act goes, in my mind, much further in the direction of social equity uh, than the other proposals that are out there. And I want to opine just briefly on the uh, Safe Banking Act uh, because I have a very unpopular opinion on this, uh, and that's that I don't think it's going to change anything, or at least not very much, uh, because FinCEN, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, uh, has already promulgated rules in 2014 uh, that are supposed to allow uh, banks to uh, to offer accounts to to you know cannabis companies. A lot of them do, usually small banks. Um, but it's very expensive for a cannabis company to acquire uh, to acquire one of those accounts because the reporting requirements uh, that a financial institution has to go through are hugely labor intensive uh, for the bank. And so, you know, in order for them to not lose money on that account, they have to charge a lot. Um, the States Reform Act, or sorry, the the State Banking Act wouldn't really change that. It just requires FinCEN to. Uh, again, promulgate new rules that are worded slightly differently, uh, but doesn't fix the underlying problem that it's not illegal to offer a, a bank account to a cannabis company. Uh, it's just prohibitively expensive to do so, and that would continue to be the case. Be the case. So before we move on, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please. I um, just wanted to preview something because I completely agree with Jeff's unpopular opinion that it's not going to change anything and particularly for small minority owned businesses. Um, I just wanted to preview that I'm part of the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition. Um, and I have some brilliant colleagues who are putting together solutions, um, promote, proposed amendments to safe banking that would in fact make it match the talking points around it. So look forward to that. Shaleen, could you discuss some of those solutions about, um, you know, how banking and social equity initiatives could move more in lockstep than uh, we've seen in the past? 
I actually don't want to um, preempt the paper. I, I will point sure. out the okay. problems with safe banking, which is that it gives a safe harbor to financial institutions and then completely leaves all discretion up to them as to whether they're going to work with businesses on what terms, you know, if they're going to comply with the anti-discrimination laws that are in place that already don't work when we look at racial disparities in financial services and lending in general. So those are all the problems that we need to address. Appreciate that. With the few minutes we have left, I want to turn. We have a lot of really good audience Q and A, so I've been sort of filtering them as they come in. Um, one question from Grant Smith Ellis, which I think is actually a pretty, pretty interesting history question. Um, it says, in the early 1900s, trust busting came into vogue following the rise of railroad and steel monopolies. What lessons can we take from that when it comes to sort of war warding off, I think Scott's term was oligopolistic, if I said that right, uh, consolidation of the legal cannabis market? Um, what are the lessons we can learn from that era and how can we sort of apply that today? Um, Scott, since I used your word, I'll, I'll have you start and then uh, we can continue from there. Well, it's a great question that honestly warrants more thought than um, just kind of off the cuff response. It'd probably make a really good law review article if somebody wants to write it. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think what's really uh, interesting about about the cannabis industry when you compare it to that, right, is like in in the in the context of those uh in the, in the trust busting era right there were existing monopolies right they had already formed like standard oil it had already formed and the task was like how do we unwind this thing right what laws do we need to pass it's sherman app right to make to to make sure that the government has the power to you know bust up this monopoly and now we're facing actually yeah, like the complete opposite problem where we're like we need to prevent a monopoly or an oligopoly from forming. What rules do we need to have in place to do that, right? And so um, I know that isn't entirely responsive to what the lessons are, but um, I, I, think it's an I think it's interesting to frame that problem and kind of realize the opportunity we have to like get in front of the issue. Um, I don't know, Shailene, one thing you've talked about is, is um, limiting vertical in integration um in in interstate commerce and you know like you see that in other industries there's something you know there's similar rules for banking at one point in time uh that may have helped to prevent hyper consolidation in that industry so i'd be curious to hear kind of what what you think about uh vertical integration as a as a solution to preventing that kind of uh monopoly from from forming yeah, ideally for me, we would only allow um, certain smaller businesses or the type that we're trying to promote to have vertical integration. Um, also, we need limits on mega mergers. It's been so clear from big tech and other places that that is what ultimately results in the problem. And we don't really have any protections in place. So I would start there. Also, um, because that's a great question, I know a lot of people care about this. Um, there's a great book called The Curse of Bigness. Um, and it's a really small, quick read that'll inspire you about all these issues. And I'm gonna put the link in the chat. I'd also plug The Robber Barons, which is another great historical account of, of that era. Can I just jump in? Please, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I think, I think in looking at trying to avoid oligopoly, um, we need to look at how the current system is actually, uh, you know, forcing that into re into happening now, right? Uh, it, it, in Oregon and California, we had we had unlimited licensing, um, and and we don't really have you know the MSO problem out here. There are large companies on the West Coast, but nobody in California controls you know two percent or three percent of the flour that's being sold, right? It, it's it's broadly spread out. It's the limit, but in the limited license states. Right, we have set this up so that the only viable, you know, production method or or the fastest and best viable production method is, you know, is hundreds of thousands of square feet, right, under a limited license that's protected. And I think that um, the minute we tear down that the the state walls, right, the minute we start to allow states to open that up, um, those large companies um, are suddenly going to be competing against thousands of other suppliers instead of a dozen other suppliers. 
right? And they'll be competing against places that have, you know, other natural advantages. And so we are, I think we are artificially creating oligopoly. Um, and I think that state silos are uh, a, a huge part of that. And, you know, if you open those borders, um, there are things we can do to support making sure uh, that small businesses have uh, advantage there and that it's possible for those small businesses to, to participate across state lines, but we're not, but, but right now we are, um, we are driving toward oligopoly and the longer we keep the state silos up, the more um, I, I think the, the worse that problem is going to get. Yeah, appreciate I, that, I would, Adam. Yep. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I, I would just uh, I would build on that and just add that uh, you know monopolies are uh, almost always the result of some government assistance uh, to the monopolistic company, right? <laughs> like uh, they result from huge barriers to entry. Sometimes those barriers are natural, like building a utility company. Uh, it's just so capital intensive. Uh, that that really only one person can do it efficiently, right? Uh, but usually it's because it's it's prohibitively expensive to be licensed, uh, or there are only a certain number of licenses. So uh, you know we, we don't we don't tend to experience uh, monopolistic practices and things like cereal production uh, or or corn farming uh, because you know the, these are these are openly competitive markets, and I, I think the same lesson will apply to cannabis. One more pretty interesting question, um, maybe a little bit beyond the scope of this panel, but interesting nonetheless. Um, it's from Paul Seaborn, and it regards international trade between specific states and countries like Canada um, or in the future Mexico that have legalized cannabis. Could that happen before there is full U.S. federal legalization? Is there any sort of historical corollary where uh, Oregon has ended a trade agreement with Canada or something like that? So I'm interested to hear Scott's take, but I think that this is unconstitutional uh, for states to engage in foreign policy making. Uh, yep, uh, I think that would be pretty unconstitutional as well. So the, the Commerce Clause uh, also gives uh, exclusive power over international trade, right, to the federal government. Um, so I, I don't think you like a, like an official trade agreement between us like a state and a foreign entity would would be unconstitutional pretty straightforward adam i saw you nodding is there anything you'd like to add to that no i'm leave it to the practicing lawyers <laughs> <laughs> makes sense um, let's see. I know we. I, I wanted to ask one more question. Um, I know. Uh, I know we're just like about a minute over time. Um, but this question is directed to you, Adam. It's from Lou Rinaldi. Um, but it it it's basically a question about regulatory capture. Um, would your approach that you're advocating, um, these sort of multilateral agreements between states, um, could that free up markets that are in regulatory capture right now? Uh, what's your opinion on that, and how could that change? Well. I I mean, I think that the states that are most likely um, to engage early on in a, in a state option uh, system of commerce are, you know, are the most forward thinking, are probably the most forward thinking states uh, on cannabis. And I think that, you know, given that there, there are states that are in better or worse shape um, on the regulatory side, but I think this will drive, uh, this will drive regulation toward uh, something that looks more homogenized, uh, be, you know, within a within a um, an interstate structure, right? I, you know, you don't have to you don't have to same, have the same testing requirements uh, in New York as California, right? New York can have its own testing requirement and say anything that's sold here, whether it's grown in New York or grown elsewhere, has to meet our testing requirement, right? And then you know, I can guarantee that you know, several weeks later, every lab on the West Coast will be offering testing to the New York standard for those who want to send their product. To New York, right, and so, um, and so, I think it's an opportunity. You know, we have uh, Canra has come together, which is the 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 you know organization of cannabis regulators. There's um, Shaleen's organization, regul regulators of color. Um, we have conversations between regulators. They know that at some point the regulations are going to have to get somewhat more homogenized, even if they don't have to have the exact same labeling and testing standards. Um, and I think that's. Uh, a big advantage to allowing the states to take the lead, right? That expertise and that, you know, that history of, of you know, bringing this industry up out of nothing 
um, is going to give us a real opportunity to take the best, the states that are doing it the best, and sort of drive the industry in that direction uh, in a way that, you know, that doesn't suddenly destroy state programs, right, that allow state equity programs and things that they're working on to continue moving forward. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I, I, this is one of the reasons why I'm really committed to having the states lay out this framework and getting this going um, without sort of crossing fingers and hoping the feds get it right and, and waiting for that moment. Great. Um, we are just about at time, so I want to give all of our panelists just a minute or two to give some final thoughts. So, Shalene, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to tell the importance of uniform data collection. It doesn't get uh, mentioned enough, but that's really the key to good policy. And if we can start that now at the state level or with incremental federal uh, steps, we're going to be so much better prepared. Um, I also want to make sure people are following uh, Drug Enforcement and Policy Center for all of the papers that they put out. And then if you're interested in this whole idea of corporate accountability and preventing monopolies, um, please check out Parabola Center's work. I think it's really important to understand when we talk about federal legalization that the idea that it will automatically create an opening up of the market is such a myth when in fact we still have to de deal with state and local regulations and Amazon and Altria are supporting all of these bills openly, right? So we need to have another discussion about what we all want it to look like. So check that out. And then thanks again so much to the speakers and thank you, Jeremy, for a great job moderating. Appreciate it. Scott, you next, please. Sure. So yeah, so uh, thanks again, Shailene, Doug, everyone at OSU. Thanks to Adam, uh, Jeff, Jeremy. Thanks to everyone in the audience. Really appreciate you all sharing uh, some some time today. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of reiterate that I want to reiterate my view that uh, there should be a, a defined transition period where the Dormant Commerce Clause is suspended. And just to, to point out two subsidiary things about that, one, right, states could still choose to participate in interstate commerce during that time if, if they want, and states can also choose to partially participate, right, which makes the proposal consistent with, with, with Shailene's position, where a state could say, we're only going to let our social equity businesses participate uh, in interstate commerce, for example. Um, and, all, and also, I think my proposal is consistent with, with Adams, right? Um, I, I like the idea of, of states just going ahead and uh, so long as they do it thoughtfully and, and carefully and in a way that promotes equity, uh, you know, why, why wait for, for Congress? I'm, I think I'm pretty on board with that, Adam. Um, in, in a lot of ways that doesn't eliminate the need to suspend the Dormant Commerce Clause, but it would, it would allow for some state experimentation that would help inform what uh, interstate commerce is going to look like. So I, I appreciate um, I appreciate your your proposal a lot, um, and I think it's you know pretty consistent with with what I've suggested. Uh, Jeff, we'll go to you next. Yeah, sure. I thank thank everyone for uh, uh, their participation uh, along with me on the on the panel today. This has been great. Um, I would say that. Uh, you know, if, if you're interested in further reason, uh, reading, check out the Reason Foundation at reason.org. Uh, we have a lot of drug policy, not just cannabis, uh, but mostly cannabis related stuff. Uh, and uh, since I'm an economist and accountant, we tend to focus a lot on the effect of tax rates um, and the, uh, the kind of result that that has on individual decisions to participate in the legal versus the illegal market. Um, those consumer and producer trade-offs are very important uh, as part of the market dynamics. Um, we are also very, uh, very much staunch free traders. Uh, so, uh, you know, our, our position is that we should uh, delve into interstate commerce as, as quickly as possible. We should wipe away uh, state limited license requirements. Um, and uh, our preferred vehicle for doing that is, of course, uh, the States Reform Act, uh, which is uh, which we have promoted through uh, through another uh, partnership that we created called the Cannabis Freedom Alliance. And at CannabisFreedomAlliance.org, there's also a lot of good content on uh, on kind of the substance of 
uh, federal legalization and interstate commerce. Last but not least, Adam. Uh, yeah, again, I'll, you know, thank you everyone. And Jeremy, what a terrific job on a uh, panel with a quickly moving subject. And so thanks so much for um, your expertise in guiding this. Um, interstate commerce is, is coming and I think we all know and I think we've all touched on how important it is that we get the details right um, and how important it is that we do it thoughtfully. Uh, you know, we've obviously been pushing toward um, doing that, at, you know, at the state level. We think that there is a really good chance uh, that if asked, uh, Biden's Department of Justice will elect not to fight with uh, mostly Democratic governors over cannabis and will let the, the states do this if they, if they want uh, and, and create a regulatory framework. Um, and we think that, you know, we think that it's uh, a much faster path to get there um, potentially than waiting for than waiting for Congress to sort of get the whole thing right, um, and and also uh, you know we have we have I think a lot better traction in the states to make sure we get it right. There's always going to be a political argument about what those details are. The question is where where we have those arguments and where we are best positioned um, to come you know to to find some solutions that can inform policy later. And we think that's at the state level. If uh, folks are interested in talking about this. Uh, or getting involved in our efforts to make this happen through the states, you can find us at sensiblemarkets.org or you can email me directly at adam at sensiblemarkets.org. Um, and thanks again for having me. This has been a great conversation. Awesome. We are over time, so I'll let you all go. Uh, quick plug, follow my work. You can find me on Twitter, Business Insider, um, or in your inbox with the newsletter as well. Um, thanks to the DEPC for setting this up. Shaleen, Adam, Scott, Jeff, and Doug, thank you so much for your cogent thoughts. Look forward to continuing the discussion. We could have gone on for three and a half hours, it feels like. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. And thanks to all the panelists again. And uh, we have to do this again because there's so much still to talk about. So have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us and uh, look out for the next panel soon.